my goodness. I have no common sense, I tell you. I see Ann is in the house, my dear friend Ann. Thank you very much, Jackie. I'm feeling it too. We got uh, the technical glitches out of the way. Making sure we got everybody rolling in. No, no, Nicole is here. All right, let's get this puppy on the road here. Hello, Nick. <laughs> Christopher is here now. We've gotten all this out of the way. <laughs> oh, you're so kind, Ann. Um, this is two days removed from going to the dentist and letting him have his way with me. Uh, and uh, I can actually kind of like move my mouth around. So uh, we're going to spend some time with Christopher. So let's uh, let's get him in here. <laughs> oh man dude seriously you are the bomb uh thank you so much for doing this uh we had fun trying to make this happen <laughs> I'm happy to see it. uh you got uh so many people uh i put up one posting that you're coming soon and my direct message box blew up dude seriously people were sending me messages like you got to tell us when you got to tell us when I said, no, it's a part of my marketing. I'm not letting you know nothing. You just have to keep watching and waiting for him to show up. That's great. You know, I'm just happy to put this information out there and you know, bring the awareness to people. Yeah, well, you got it going on. You, dude, we haven't even started, and the hearts are, like, freaking across the screen right now. <laughs> I can barely see your face. It's, like, uh, totally, like, uh, mom, mom wins 11. Thank you very much for the while. Uh, the man is in the house. Uh, I don't want to um, take too much time about my story and my connection to you since uh, we really haven't got a chance to, uh, to talk that much about that. Uh, but I have watched your work for quite a while. Uh, I am honored that uh, you have taken out of your busy schedule to be here. But uh, nobody, nobody watches this channel, Narcabuse underscore TV. Nobody watches this network for me. They watch it for my guests. But I am telling you, my messages blew up when people knew that you were coming on the show. I like, it was like, oh my goodness, I don't know what questions to ask now. <laughs> I'm like, the pressure is on. But no pressure. You know why? Um, I'm seriously looking. I mean, I don't know if you can see the screen. Uh, Jackie is saying, I am so humbled by this. Uh, I am truly humbled, too, because I want to pick your brain so much. Your videos are so, so good. Um, they're very slick moving. They're simple to follow. And 85% of the guys, 80% uh, of the direct messages I receive are from men. And the guys were just excited you were going to come on. Uh, they had a lot of suggestions and a lot of things they wanted to hear. Uh, but we're going to do the best that we can with the time allotted. Uh, so enough of me. I've got to ask you about something that has been the big subject that everybody wanted me to ask you as the first thing to talk about, and that's going no contact. Right. They want to pick your brain or at least have you drop some knowledge because a lot of the people that ask this question are just now understanding what narcissism and narcissistic behavior is. Why is no contact extremely important? No contact can be very important, but at the same time, I think, um, you know, when a lot of people say you should just go no contact, that doesn't apply to everyone. In many right. situations, that's actually not a good idea. Got it. Some people are involved with narcissists who could be very dangerous. Uh, they could be at risk of uh, danger or harm. And, of course, in those situations, 
if you just go no contact, who knows what will happen. Okay. But also in many situations, going no contact can be a good idea. You know, it is good to separate yourself from narcissists. Um, you know, while in the beginning, you might feel lonely, you might feel upset about everything that's happened. You may even feel guilty in a lot of cases. But as time goes by, you will start to feel happier and healthier. But as I said, in some situations, it's not always a good idea to just go no contact. You don't know how they're going to react. They take it as rejection. And rejection causes a narcissistic injury. A person should be careful about rejecting the narcissist, but they have to also be mindful that they need to protect themselves. Correct me if I say it wrong. Is that kind of the idea? You're right. There's, there needs to be a balance between protecting yourself and also considering how the narcissist might react. Because if you just go and you, you go no contact and um, you know, let's say the narcissist has been violent before, you could be putting yourself at risk because you don't know what they're going to do if you do just go no contact. But then of course, in some situations, you may know how they're going to react or you may have people around you who can support you. And mm -hmm. in those in those cases, it may be safe to go into contact. One of my viewers, just so you know, periodically I'll do this uh, as long as we have time together. Uh, Anne uh, underscore Crosby underscore, she's one of the regular viewers. She mentioned that she had uh, to do that, uh, being mindful of who she was dealing with, but had to go no contact. When it comes to um, the reaction of the narcissist, they may either be violent you kind of touched on that what if they're not violent what are some things that they start to do if we go no contact that's just one of the things really i mean there are a lot of narcissists especially covid narcissists who they might just give you the silent treatment back and then they'll oh, go okay. and they'll smear your name to other people They'll try to get people to see it as though you've abandoned them, as though you've done something wrong. Mm -hmm. And they can enforce fly monkeys, you know, people who do their bidding. And it can start a smear campaign. And it can just affect your entire family, friends, and workplace. In a matter of fact, uh, that's what's coming across the screen right now. I don't know how close. Can, can you see the screen pretty good? Because uh, um, I'm a bit uh, man, far away. Yeah. Okay, I, I know you. I, I know we had talked about that. You're kind of far away, maybe from it. But uh, you're hitting. You're hitting so many spots right now. I can't keep up with the screen. So, so, so everybody, I'm not trying to ignore you guys. I see it, but I just don't want to cut Chris off when he's talking at the same time. But uh, I'm gonna go back to the screen here. Uh, Anne and others were saying they're agreeing with you. Uh, others are mentioning the fact that this is something that they had to do and be mindful of. Um, I'm trying to scroll here. Go ahead. You, anything else that you could mention in regards to no contact? Many of my uh, viewers are survivors, uh, like yourself, uh, of narcissism, but they're struggling sometimes with the no contact and some of the little tricks of the trade that a narcissist will, um, will you know, implement to draw them back in. What are some things that a person needs to be mindful of if they're not aware that these little tricks can start to be used along with the smear campaign to draw somebody back into their control. I personally think it's best to go limited contact at first and then just gradually fizzle out because what you might notice is that if you just gradually pull back your attention, gradually pull back the supply, they might just go and find someone else on their own. Okay. Because they, they notice that your supply is slipping away. They but, themselves 
Go ahead, Chris. Go ahead, please. You were going to say. Go ahead. But if you just take the attention away so quickly, <clears throat> that can cause an injury then. That can cause them to react. Right, right. <laughs> uh, somebody uh, just mentioned the fact that they wanted to know uh, about trauma bonding. Um, what are you, what is your expertise when it comes to explaining trauma bonding and talking about trauma bonding? To keep it simple, I think with the trauma bond, it's just throughout the relationship, we are taught to doubt ourselves. We're taught to doubt our own intuition. We're taught to think that our thoughts are not right. And to break the trauma bond, it's about trusting ourselves again. Because what tends to happen is we seem to seek validation from the narcissist. And that's how we get bonded to them. It's like we're seeking validation from the very person who hurt us. And of course, when we go back to them, they never validate us. They just hurt us even more. And that only strengthens the trauma bond. Uh, how can a person um, navigate so that they're not falling into that trauma bond and having this re the repetitive, hold on one second, please. <laughs> they have this repetitive cycle of abuse because they keep falling for this trauma bond. How can someone nip that in the bud? I think what they need to do is just start trusting themselves more. Start listening to themselves instead of doubting their intuition, which is what they've been taught to do by the narcissist. So the, the narcissist gets a person to second guess themselves all the time. Uh, that ties into gaslighting then. Somebody mentioned that here. They wanted you to talk about also gaslighting. Now, I'm going to be just throwing this stuff at you. Don't, don't mind me. I'm, the whole show now is going to really go off of what's on my screen. By the way, everybody, if you have questions for Christopher, uh, the narc survivor from YouTube, uh, please put them in the questions section. It's not a problem. Feel free to go ahead and put the questions there. Uh, if you have statements or anything like that, uh, that way I can pull them out and uh, it's easier to get a hold of them that way instead of I will miss them if they just keep scrolling. After a while, I won't be able to catch them. Uh, about gaslighting, feel free to talk about that. Gaslighting is when the narcissist wants you to doubt your own perception. They want you to think that whatever they say is right. Hmm. And they will often try to isolate you from other people so that they're only so, so that your only source of validation is them. So that they can just tell you what's right and what's wrong. So gaslighting really is an altering of our personal perception on their part. They're trying to alter the way we see reality, as it were. I, remember now, Chris, correct me, because I'm, I'm not the expert. Uh, so, so they're trying to do that. But trauma bonding is more of making us second-guess our own decision-making and, and, and the choices we make. Is that, I'll make sure I understand that. Is that what trauma bonding kind of does? It makes us second-guess our, or no? I said that wrong. That's right. It, it makes us doubt ourselves as well. You know, it's, it makes us want to seek their validation. You know, it's um, the gaslighting is more about making us doubt our perception. And then the trauma bond is more when we seek their validation. Uh, okay, got it. Um, I'm going to try my best to keep up with everybody here. You guys just keep, uh, keep give me the questions. It's not a problem. Um, here we go here. Uh, question for you. Jack, uh, Jackie uh, asked the question, should you throw away all of their gifts? It depends. You know, what is the reason why you want to do that? Is it so you're not thinking about them anymore? 
because I, I don't know, um, you know, what direction we want this to go in. You know, if we want to talk about this from a spiritual perspective, um, you know, everything made up of energy. Go right ahead. So go right ahead. If you're keeping their stuff in your home, whether it's clothes or gifts, whatever it may be, from a, from a spiritual perspective, that carries energy. And you're keeping that energy around you, which is also going to strengthen that trauma bond. It's going to make it more difficult for you to move on. And if you get rid of those gifts, if you get rid of those clothes, you will find that you instantly feel better. You, you're getting a lot. You're getting a lot of uh, nodding heads on that and hearts, and a lot of appreciation for that because a lot of people are agreeing with you on that. Um, when it comes to cognitive dissonance, uh, the question is asked: uh, Could you could you shed some light on that for many who may try to get an understanding of what it means? when the brain starts to deal with that? Cognitive dissonance is two conflicting beliefs. What happens is we hold on to the image that they display to us at the beginning. Mm -hmm. But what we have to understand is what they showed us at the beginning wasn't a fair representation of who they are. They manipulated us. They did that to lure us into the relationship. And what makes it worse is that even after they devalue us, they can often bring back the love bombing phase. And it makes us think, is that really them or not? That's what the cognitive dissonance is. And again, it's all about trusting yourself and recognizing that that person who puts you down, that person who insults you and makes you feel like you're not good enough, that's who they really are. And they're not that person they, they portrayed at the beginning because they never were in love in the first place. Is that a good guess? I mean, is that a, am I saying that right? That's right. It was just an act to lure you in so that they could get what they want. And whatever they want, it will eventually come. I mean, it'll come to the top. It'll come to the service. It'll come out whatever they eventually wanted. Right. It'll make it'll come clear. That's right. Especially when it moves to the devaluation phase. That's when their mask comes all the way off and they'll just okay. come out and tell you exactly what they want. Wow. Uh, you know how everything's not enough and they want more they'll make wow. that clear to you then okay so okay I, I've got a yeah, I want to ask some more questions on that but hold on one second I, uh, I don't want to ignore everybody here uh, a few people mentioned the fact about the gifts you mentioned about the, the energy uh, a lot of people are saying donate them or sell them on eBay <laughs> if, uh, if it's a diamond ring everybody's got you know there's some jokes in there some pretty good jokes I just don't, I don't have a big enough screen. I should have been more prepared. I have a bigger screen I could have used, but to keep up with everybody's funny comments, but uh, everybody's agreeing with you. You know, you need to kind of get that uh, stuff out of your life. Um, let's see here. I uh, got some more questions for you. Give me one more second. They pray up on the vulnerable. Uh, Jackie says, uh, Anne mentions the fact, uh, uh, everybody's agreeing with you. Uh, B mentions about self-love, agreeing with what with, with you mentioned, that self-love is important. Um, so many others here everybody please keep making your comments or put them in the question section that way it'll be easier for me to read them uh, and they won't scroll so fast uh, even if you don't have a question you have a comment just go ahead and put it in our, the question section uh, there on the screen um, I have a question for you here that somebody puts uh, what to do if this someone is your co-worker and you have to tell your boss to see his mask So you have to you have to tell his boss to uh, to see that that person's a narcissist. They want the boss to recognize it too. 
it's difficult in those situations because a lot of the times when it comes to the workplace, the ones who are very successful in those areas mm -hmm. are often sociopaths. Wow. And the management, I saw a statistic, I think it said um, one in 20 CEOs are psychopaths. Okay, that's crazy, man. <laughs> okay. <laughs> It can wow. be very difficult in those situations. But what I, what I would recommend is gathering evidence and then bringing that evidence to the management. Because in those situations, that's all you can really do. And as I said, you know, I think one in 20 CEOs are meant to be psychopaths. So even then, it may not help. And you may okay. have to move on to a different workplace right. unless you can tolerate being around those types of personalities. So it's an uphill battle that sometimes is not winnable and maybe have to move on or do something different. But definitely collect evidence. Uh, keep a record is what you're kind of highlighting. Uh, somebody put on here agreeing with you. Uh, Adam, Adam uh, underscore dark underscore survivor says he's agreeing with you. It was never love. Their version of love is superficial. Would you agree with that? That's what Adam put on here. It is. Their idea of love is what you can do for them or how you can make them feel or how you can make them appear to other people. That's all their love really is. Huh. That's not love. That's crazy. <laughs> that's, that's crazy. Uh, somebody's got on the screen here. Oh, I'm sorry. That's Jackie. Jackie says, let them hang themselves with their own rope. Is that kind of what you were highlighting at the very beginning about going no contact, that we got to be careful who we're going no contact with? We may have to quietly do it. That's right. You know, a lot of people... They try to expose the narcissist, thinking that that's going to solve everything. But as that person said, you can just let them hang themselves. Just take a step back and let their own behavior show everyone who they are. Got it. Let their own behavior. Go ahead. Go ahead. I'm sorry, Chris. Go ahead. If you let them, they will reveal who they are. You just have to if give space to do it. So don't be quick to jump in to try to uh, figure them out, to hear what they got to say all the time. Let their behavior show itself. That's right. Because they're really trying to take cover. I'm just, based upon what you said, they're really just trying to take cover behind us. That's right. What they do is they just try and they, they'll just deny anything that you've said, or they'll just shift the blame onto you or someone else. They use gaslighting, but they're not going to take accountability for their actions. Sometimes okay. if you have all of the evidence, even if you've got video recordings and you show it to them, wow. they'll still deny it. That's just crazy. All right, now, uh, mom wins 11. Her Instagram name is momwins11. She wants to ask you this. Why do you think I feel guilty for not allowing the narcissist back in my life? That actually goes back to childhood conditioning. Maybe you were made to feel bad for one of your parents. You were made to feel guilty. Because as we know, narcissistic parents, they always like to play the victim, especially the ones that are covert. So you're conditioned to feel that way when you then get into relationships, especially if you're with a covert narcissist who always plays the victim. You're conditioned to feel bad for them. When it comes to 
people who have never experienced what we're discussing today and what my channel here is all about, a platform to, to bring awareness and exposure to narcissism, how, how can you kind of describe for people what it's like to live with a narcissistic person if they themselves can't relate? I don't think you really can describe it for someone who hasn't actually been through it. It's difficult because it's one of those things where if you did describe it, you know, a lot of people will just say, get over it. Yeah. That's literally how they will see it because to them, it's just a relationship. It's just conflict. It's just a breakup. They're not really going to understand unless they've been through it themselves. They don't see the danger that that person presents to, that, to, to your life or to, a, to the victim's life. So they just, you know, just kick it to the curb, just ignore it. It's just, you know, it's just a little squabble. But they don't see that that person's a predator. That's right. You know, it's not just the narcissist who gaslights us. There can be secondary and tertiary gaslighting which wow. can come from family and friends and even therapists who don't understand what narcissism is. Wow. And they would have been doing all the behind the scenes work, uh, gathering all these people as a part of their flying monkeys and support group. Matter of fact, um, somebody here, uh, Jackie, Jackie puts on the screen that sometimes there may be a need to change your identity. If you're in danger, when you're dealing with a narcissist, is that possible also? Um, I'm not sure about that. I haven't really spoken to anyone so far who has done that. But, you know, I, I could understand it. I mean, in many situations, I'm sure it can get to that point. Uh, I, I, have to, I, I have to tell you, I've had four people on my show. They've actually had to do that. It surprised me. Wow. But but they literally had to because and they moved on the other side of the world. Matter of fact, they're out there where you are to try to get away uh, because they kept finding them here in the States uh, and stalking them. So it's just uh, I guess that can happen. Um, but I do have to run this by you. Um, somebody's saying here they use people as a pawn, but they appear normal. Is that a part of their trademark? That's they right. hide their they hide their false self in order to get supply. Not only can they seem normal, when you first meet a narcissist, mm -hmm. especially the ones that are overt, they can seem very charming and charismatic. They can often seem like the life of the party. Mm. Whereas the coverts can also they they can seem more quiet and shy it's like they in their minds they still think they're superior even though they're quiet and shy they still so it's, it's right. a fake it's a fake shyness is what they're doing this i think they they can actually be shy for real it's just it's like they think they're better than everyone but it's as though the world doesn't agree with it the world hasn't seen that yet so they can't be overt. But then that same narcissist, if you put them in an environment where everyone supports them, everyone praises them, you could see a completely different character. Yeah, well, um, I got to tell you this. If people are agreeing with you on the screen. And matter of fact, uh, somebody's mentioning here, uh, I believe it says Ursula. Ursula is mentioning that uh, her, the narcissist she dealt with needed to or wanted to make sure he felt good by, by being the center of attention wherever they went somewhere. Yep, that's, that's really what the, the overt narcissists are like. You know, but a narcissist can be both overt and covert. It really what's the difference around um, what's the what's the main difference for somebody who's just now and a member I, I did highlight uh, to you and I tell people this all the time 
this channel picks up a lot of people just learning about it. So please break down the, uh, that the overt and the covert. What are what are the basic understandings? The difference between the two. And then I have some questions here for you that people are, have coming in. An overt can seem more extroverted. It's like they need constant attention. They need constant praise. And the world tends to agree with them. Huh. The world tends to think that they are amazing. They portray this charming and charismatic personality and everyone agrees with it. People think that they can't do anything wrong mm. and that's how they get away with it. But with the covert narcissist, it's like they instinctually know that they can't get away with it. They can't just walk around acting grandiose because they know that not everyone will agree with that. And that's why they stay covert. Does it matter which book? Both are, are predators, but is the covert more dangerous than the overt or is the overt more dangerous than the, or are we talking about an equal playing field of danger? In my opinion, the covert is far more dangerous. Because with the Why over, with the over, you know what you're getting into. Got it. You can Got see it. it right from the start. This person is arrogant, the grandiose. They think they're better than everyone. Mm -hmm. You can see that. But with the covert, they hide that from you. They mm -hmm. can come across as a quiet, shy, and kind person. But they're not. Matter of fact, Anne puts on the screen here, they don't understand that they're narcissists, in other words. Um, Maybe they do? In some situations, yes. It's, um, wow. It depends on their level of awareness. You know, they know that there's something not right with them. Deep down, they know that what they're doing is wrong. Although they may not know what a narcissist is, they know that they're manipulating people. They know that they're not telling the truth. They know these things. They know it. They literally know it. At some level, they do. But there um, are levels of awareness. That the narc has. There are levels of awareness that a narc has. That's right. You know, it goes right from someone who has almost no awareness of their behaviors or how it affects people mm -hmm. right up to someone who knows exactly what a narcissist is and knows that they are one. Wow. And, you know, even on YouTube, there are some YouTubers who just come out and say that they are the narcissist. Wow. Post videos about it. And they understand how their behavior affects someone else. Let's say an empath. Uh, Jackie puts on the screen here that uh, being an empath, she's in the process of, of working her way uh, in dealing with this after uh, having to deal with a narcissist. Um, how can an empath, uh, often described as the person who becomes the victim of a narcissist or the prey, what process, what are some of the things they need to go through to process and work toward getting their own life back it's not something that happens overnight it will take a long time but then that also depends on how long the relationship was and how damaging the effects were with the narcissist but it's it doesn't just heal overnight this is something that could take six months if it was a short relationship maybe one to two years and it takes consistency and dedication this is something where every day you need to be doing something that move towards um, 
your healing. Right. When a person when a person uh, finds themselves dealing with a narcissist, uh, Anne puts on here that sometimes they can the narcissist can hide uh, their fault their their true self by covering it with this false self in order to get supply. That becomes uh, something that a lot of people have happened to them, that they think they're talking to one person and they end up really just talking to this false self. That's right. You know, it's, um, it's not commonly talked about because, um, you know, it's like no one really talks about what the true self actually is. But, um, you know, what it is, is it's something that they abandoned a long time ago, where they created a false self. So in many situations, this is done in childhood. In childhood, they've been told that they're not good enough. So they discard themselves. They wow. discover their true self. And, of course, that part of them is still there. But it's underdeveloped. Whatever age they discarded it, that's the level of development it's still at. And that is why you can often see this character that comes out. Mm-hmm. You know, when you see the true self, it's like a child. It's a child that's either shouting and screaming mm-hmm. or crying for attention. Wow. And, and so the true self, when it does show itself, it's going to show itself one of those two ways you just mentioned. But the false self will be something that they, they put on every day or given moments of the day to, to exist as it were, to live. That's right. That's why they need supply. It's a supply that keeps the false self going. And And any... Oh, go ahead, Chris. Go ahead, please. Any criticism... Right, right, right. Validation. If you don't believe the lies they're telling you... Right. Validate the illusion. Mm -hmm. That can cause an injury which causes the false self to collapse and it reduces them to the true self. And the true self doesn't really then have the necessary ammunition in life to live. It doesn't have the people skills, social skills, or maybe even other skills because they propped up this false person who has this knowledge or skill or whatever it may be. And actually they know they don't carry those things. If I said that right, correct me if I'm wrong. That's very true. That's crazy. I'm sorry. I'm just int- I'm intrigued by the whole thing. I- I've got to do this, uh, and then we're gonna uh, I'm gonna run some questions by you. And then we're gonna take a look at something else. Okay. Wow. Uh, I'm just gonna ask you. It says, uh, "Isn't a narcissist whose inner child and parent need isn't a narcissist a person whose inner child and parent needs to be healed?" Uh, is kind of what I'm reading there in that question. And uh, and if if that is the case, their inner child or parent or whatever needs to be healed. Can we help them? That was from Beth. It's very. Uh, Jim, that was excuse yeah. me. That was from be be the light of the world. Go ahead, Chris. You were saying. A lot of experts and psychologists disagree on that. You know, on whether or not. Narcissists can be healed and how they would be healed. And I personally think that anyone can be healed. Mm -hmm. But on the one condition that they have to want to be healed. Mm -hmm. Narcissists, for one thing, they don't even think there's an issue with them. Mm -hmm. They think everyone else. And why would they want to be healed if they're getting supply? If they're getting everything they want, there's no reason for them to want to do that. 
it's only really in a crisis that you might see a narcissist going to therapy. And even then, they're not doing it for anyone but themselves. So they, if they don't see a need to be healed, if they are getting their, their, their supply, their fix, if they're getting their fix, what's the point? So you got a question here on the screen. Uh, can This is from Anne. Can they be covert and malignant combined? Definitely, yes. Yes, they can be. As malignant narcissists, they can be either COVID or OVID. The, the uh, <laughs> excuse me, uh, the secret beauty. I'm actually going to lose my voice today. I cannot lose it today with, with Christopher here. <laughs> Dude, seriously. Uh, secret beauty <laughs> asked this question of you, Chris. Um, it's I read made this statement. You could piggyback if you like. It says my ex narc presented himself as a saint. It's evidently a common trait based upon what I'm reading across the screen that uh, the that a lot of them present themselves in this holier than thou um, high moral type of a a, a person. Is that common? Yes, especially um, with self-righteous narcissists. Wow. They act as though they hold these um, very high moral values. Mm -hmm. um, but really, that's for everyone else. It's not, not for them. <laughs> not for them. So they can do whatever dirt they want, but you better not. Yeah, you better jaywalk. not. You better not jaywalk. <laughs> <laughs> got it. Got it. That's crazy. Uh, talking about being a hypocrite. Uh, narcopaths are, uh, oh, the question is being asked, uh, are narcopaths the most dangerous? Um, it really starts off with um, people who have narcissistic traits and then into those who have MPD, Narcissistic mm. Personality Disorder. And then the more dangerous are the, the Antisocial Personality Disorder, mm -hmm. which is, um, you know, starts with, um, well, well, it can go from malignant narcissist to sociopaths. Oh. And of course, you know, we know that the most dangerous of all are psychopaths. Got it. Got it. But all of them are narcissists. All of them are narcissists. Um, somebody uh, got on the screen here for you. Um, I'm going to make sure I read this correctly here. Uh, let's see here. Adam. Adam of Narc Survivor. Uh, he says, I was with my covert narcissist for 20 years and didn't know it until I left, left her, left her and researched her behavior. He didn't know it until after he was gone. He was with a female narcissist. Your your thoughts on a female narcissist? That does happen a lot, you know, where victims don't realize what they were dealing with until after they've left. It's like, um, you know, we finally climb out of the rabbit hole and then everything begins to make sense. But with... Uh Female narcissists, you know, I've recently done a few videos on that. And I think a lot of it is fueled by social media. How, well, how is that? Um, I think it just presents an opportunity for women these days to express their grandiosity. And, um, you know, it creates a strong sense of entitlement, you know, where all they've got to do is just post a picture and then they get hundreds of likes. Mm -hmm. and, um, you know, all of these guys who are complimenting them, it makes them think that they're, they're all princesses and that they deserve the world, which is, um, you know, it's a very unrealistic view for them to have.
but then you know it is um it is us guys who are kind of fuel in this so many men can actually add fuel uh to a female narcissist is it possible that uh people can enable the narcissist by not allowing them to take accountability definitely we can you know when we don't hold them responsible for their actions and when we do what they want us to do which is keep in a code of silence we are enabling their behavior to continue if we you said if we keep a code of silence so in other words if we don't really address their lies uh the different things they want swept under the rug or um somebody put on the screen here uh i believe it was Jackie uh but it mentions a narcissist told me that he is a different kind of guy in other words the way they try to portray themselves if we stay silent about it and we know it's not right then we're enabling them that's right but at the same time we also need to protect ourselves and when you try to expose a narcissist or if you try and confront them nothing's really going to happen mm. they're not just going to come out and admit what they've done so it's not like talking to a normal person where you go like hey you know what i had an issue here and you kind of come to a compromise and talk about it you're saying that uh they just won't accept accountability I'm trying to think of the word uh, stonewall is that what you kind of mean or silent treatment what do you what do you, what do you mean that's right they they won't accept accountability for their actions even if you do confront them which is why a lot of therapists do recommend to just not confront the narcissist okay. you're better off um trying to go gray rock or no contact is what would you mean or find a, an exit plan that's right it should be enough just to know your truth just for you to know what is right right then somebody put your contacts and take away your emotions right somebody put on here research is the key that's why uh it was so important uh to make sure that we were able many of us wanted to make sure you were on uh this network today narcabuse underscore tv because uh, listen i literally mean this chris i cannot keep up with everybody that has stuff for you and uh, everybody i i already promised chris that i wasn't going to keep him all day uh he has um, uh many things uh to do um but can you give me just a few more minute, minutes i got uh, i i don't want to leave everybody hanging here you guys uh but i don't want to hold chris all day um he was kind enough uh to do this uh one segment with me. Uh is that all right Chris? I just want to throw a couple of things for you before we end the show. Is that all right? Sure, that's fine. Okay. So um if if I miss your your uh, questions or your thoughts here everybody, uh please go to Chris's page. His Narc Survivor uh Instagram page, Narc Survivor on YouTube uh is the page. Uh or of course you know you can always reach him as uh the the narc man himself uh on uh, YouTube um but um I got a question here going to do that real quick here uh can you talk about uh let me see here make sure I got everything here uh we did that one we did that one uh can you talk about how dangerous narcissist parents can be that's a question for you there Chris that's from uh be the light of the world 18 narcissistic parents can be very dangerous they can completely change the path of a child's life a narcissistic parent can be a determining factor in whether or not the child becomes a narcissist so they they do tend to have a huge influence on their children more than the other parent if the other parent is an a narcissist 
the narcissistic parent always has a dominant influence on the child. The child never gets a chance to really breathe and develop a true self under the umbrella of a narcissistic parent. Is that kind of the way it works or no? That's very true. A narcissistic parent will stunt the growth of the child. And that is why, um, you know, the, the, the childhood conditioning that many victims experience. Mm -hmm. If you look back, it's often the reason why people end up around narcissists in relationships mm. and even in the workplace comes back to their childhood conditioning. Wow. Almost everything that we're experiencing in the present moment goes back to the childhood. It's all different. I have a, a thought here that somebody needs to ask you before you have to go today. It says, uh, Anne asked the question, can they hide it when they have no supply? Do they get worse with time? A narcissist can probably not go a day without supply. A day? A <laughs> But there are, uh, wow. But with sociopaths and psychopaths, they can go a very long time without supply. How is and that? Even if they do have potential sources of supply, they only really go for the best of the best, or what they deem to be uh. people who they think are the most attractive, the most successful. That's what the sociopath and the psychopath is going to hold out for. And until then, they'll just remain alone. They literally will just be by themselves. <laughs> right. It's only really I, the narcissist who can't go a day without supply. Got it. They literally have to have that validation and supply, recognition, propping up of the false self on a regular basis. But a sociopath and a psychopath can go longer because they just want the best. That's right. They can be alone for longer periods of time. And um, unless, unless a person is working on their, and again, remember, Chris, just correct me before we have to, to end our time together. It, a person needs to be focusing on their self-love, or in other words, taking care of themselves emotionally, mentally, and physically, taking care of their health, so that in doing research, making sure they're getting knowledge to be able to be strong enough to walk away from a narc. If not, if we were not taking care of ourselves, then we're going to be in this constant cycle of being their prey, being victim. That's right. Healing uh -huh. is very important when you've come out of a narcissistic relationship. It's, um, it's very important to heal rather than getting back into another relationship, which will only prolong the healing and it will increase the possibilities of you meeting another narcissist. That's yeah, why somebody, healing is so important. Um, I didn't mean to cut you off, Chris. Go ahead. Anything else, please? Somebody's got something else for you before you go. Um, somebody has here, uh, let's see here, that it's, um, it was difficult. They were with a covert narc for 20 years, she writes. Uh, she puts on here. Um, please, you guys, forgive me. You got beautiful names. I'm just going to butcher them, so I'm not going to touch it. <laughs> so, so great, great IG name. I'm sorry. I just can't read that. I'll just tear it up. But for 20 years, she was with somebody. It took her longer. Now, she's not with them. It took her, seemed like it took longer to heal, she was, she's saying. And then she puts on there that uh, he threatened to kill her emotionally. Is that a common thing? That sounds like more of a malignant narcissist. They can be very sadistic. Wow. They take pleasure in your pain. They take pleasure in the pain. 
I mean, they literally will create situations to watch you suffer. Is that what you mean? That's right. You know, the lower end of the spectrum is more about getting what they want. And they kind of hope that no one gets hurt. But if they do, then so be it. But then the higher up the spectrum you go, it gets to a point where they just don't care. Wow. And some of them will intentionally seek out to cause as much punishment and suffering as they can. And they get off in it. Is there no end to it? Do they like, okay, I've done all the damage here. I've left the shell and let me move on. Or they keep coming back for more and more. Um, Sylvia puts on the, Sylvia puts on the screen just to, to piggyback uh, what you're saying. It's like they lost their soul. So they're just going to keep going until what? You croak? Commit suicide? That's right. Many of them, the malignant narcissists, it can go on forever because it's their supply. Wow. And especially if you can't do anything to stop them, then you're really a grade A source of supply there because they might not be able to find someone else who lacks the support or resources to protect themselves. If a person has the resources and they have the knowledge, they've done the research to protect themselves, then they have to end it. I'm just asking. I'm really asking more than anything else, uh, Chris. So does that mean the person who becomes aware of this, that this person has been sucking them dry emotionally and is flipping them around like a dead fish out of water and being mean to them on purpose, then once we become aware, we need to kind of, we need to end it. Is that, is that what I'm understanding uh, you're saying? It's not always that simple. Got it. Especially with those who are higher on the spectrum because there's no telling what they might do. And you might think my narcissist has never done anything that bad. Mm -hmm. But then you've got to think they only have to do it once to change. <laughs> that's, that's true. No, that's a good one. Yeah. Waiting around. Be very no, cool. go ahead, Chris. I'm sorry, Chris. You were saying, please go ahead, say that again. Definitely be very cautious okay. when you are trying to cut off the narcissist because you never know how they might react. Okay. Um, everybody, I'm going to wind this up, but I'm going to ask Chris this question from somebody that has it here that we have not touched on yet. This is from mo dot the dot chick mo dot the chick i hope i said that right anyhow uh i don't want to say this is from a chick because that just sounds that just sounds bad so so mo uh puts on here for you what happens when a narcissist meets their match meets the the match yeah that's the question what happens when a narcissist meets their match what, what do we mean by their match? Do you uh, mean? Good question. Uh, someone who uh, they probably can't take down. Let's, let's go with that. I'm going to read into what he means there. What if they've met their match? Someone they thought they could uh, run, run over, but that person has bounced back. So is that, are we describing um, maybe a, like a super empath? We'll go with that. Let's go with that. Yes. Okay. Um, it's rare. You know, that's very rare, a super empath. You know, those are about one in a million. Just for the, just for the record, uh, Mo, Mo does say that she is a chick. <laughs> just wanna, she just typed that in there. She does want you and I to know that she is a female. She is a chick, by the way. So I just want to clarify that. He wanted us to know that she is a woman. Um, but um, and maybe, Mo, you can kind of tell us uh, what you have in mind when you said that. And uh, what do you mean when the narcissist has met their match? Um, what if that, that narcissist 
was trying to discard and make make the the victim crumble under the weight of their emotional or even financial abuse and mental abuse only to have the empath rebound and through self love and working on themselves they've moved on and started another relationship and are now have a happy life would that be considered that the narc has met their match definitely i i'd say so but there there are a number of ways how they could respond to that oh really situations they they kind of have to see it as though there's something wrong like it, it's not as great as it may be but they have to minimize it in some way and they may even try to discredit you and sabotage your success wow so and, so instead of mo- moving on they literally try to come back and get some vengeance or or try to try to do something negative uh mo actually <laughs> clarify go ahead chris i'm sorry when when some situations they will just stay hidden you know huh. they know that there's not a place for them in your life anymore okay uh mo did clarify that one that she is a female she is a chick and that uh uh that's actually funny to me uh and she also wants you and i to know that what she meant by that question for you that that thought about the narcissist meeting their match She just wants to know what you think when a narcissist is with another narcissist. It doesn't go when when two this are together. It doesn't go well. Did you say it doesn't go well? Is that what you said? It doesn't go well. There is constant arguments. Um wow. But it's interesting though. It's um it's not always what people think because what tends to happen is there's one narcissist who is in the dominant position and the other who is submissive and that can change from one situation to the next so it's like seesaw dominance it's like back and forth that's right wow change very quickly as well does that last actually surprisingly in some situations it can last for a lifetime but their children if if they have children it must be horrible well what what they tend to do is to keep the peace between them yeah they bond together over someone else's destruction oh okay managed to maintain the relationship So you're telling me that they team up to be the major part of triangulation <laughs> essentially right. and find a target and they feed off of that and you have glee together. Those are the ones that last anyway. The ones that don't last is when they're just completely going at each other. <laughs> okay, dude, seriously, that's really crazy. That's that, So what do they consider peace and quiet? What do they consider happiness if the two narcs are together? Their the joy is destroyed. They thrive on dysfunction. They thrive on chaos. But do they overall, I'm just asking, overall do they know that they're both are thriving off of dysfunction and chaos? In some situations they may both think that the other is is a narcissist patients <laughs> they, th- they may they, think- they may both think that the other is an empath it really depends on the two individual narcissists oh, well uh, listen you have shed a great deal of light uh i am telling you uh, I'm able to see people who are writing me as the show goes on uh for all of my guests but uh, people are writing me telling me that they they've learned from you because of this uh this live session that we're doing together um I cannot and have not been able to keep up with everything that's happening on the screen you have had non-stop streams 
of hearts coming across the stream, uh, come across the screen for you, my friend, uh, because of your presence today on Narc Abuse TV Network. I appreciate everything uh, about you taking time to do this today and all the prep work we went uh, through to uh, try to make this uh, happen. And uh, your high tech stand that you have there uh, for your for your phone. Uh, I, I would love for you to give me a screenshot, send it to me privately, because I know you went through you went through a lot. You know what I'm talking about. You went through a lot to make sure we were able to make this happen today. Uh, yeah, it's been in the planning for a while, and I appreciate you so much uh, for shedding light for so many. Um, listen, man, seriously, if if I could just do screenshots of everything that everybody's putting on here, I would have a volume of stuff about how many people are telling you thank you. Uh, for being here on our, our channel today, this public service channel. I appreciate it. Thank you very, very, very much. Any last words or advice? Your drop-the-mic moment, my friend, uh, to social media in regards to uh, narcissism and how to uh, how to stay afloat and protect our hearts uh, from people who are predators. Um, I would say to limit the amount of time you spend thinking about these narcissists. While it is good to gather knowledge about them, it's also important to focus on yourself. Practice self-love, practice self-care. Get back to doing the things that you like to do before you got involved with a narcissist. And um, maybe book a one-on-one -on -one with me or with a therapist, you know, someone you can talk to, someone you trust, someone who can guide you in the right direction. I think all of these things are very important when you're coming out of a narcissistic relationship. Thank you so much, uh, Chris, for uh, taking the time. Christopher uh, can be found regularly uh, pumping out uh, wonderful slick moving totally cool hip you're a hip guy without even trying to be hip you're, you're you know you too hip to be square man so so totally i totally appreciate it uh don't be fooled you guys he does have a sense of humor he gets serious about narcissism but 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 he he's got a sense of humor uh the man uh is too too cool you're 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 double you're double oh seven for narcissism you're the indiana jones of narciss narcissism my friend uh, so thank you for uh, doing all that you've done to help so many and to shed light. Uh, but thank you for your words of advice right now. Everybody, thank you for being here. I love each and every one of you for supporting Narc Abuse underscore TV network, um, where we are able to have uh, individuals with great insight like you, my friend. Thank you, Chris. Enjoy yourself and enjoy the rest of well, your evening, right? Your nighttime. Uh, uh, enjoy the rest of your night. Um, thank you, everybody. Love each and every one of you, like I said, and I'm out. Thanks, Chris. We'll see you guys again. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.